But today we're going to be taking a look at a moderato by Fernando Sor. What's a moderato? Well, it's just moderate tempo. It's basically what it means, right? We could put a metronome on it, but I think mainly this is a, you want to just think of it as medium tempo. If you're going too fast, if you're going too slow, you're probably not playing a moderato. It's a moderate, it's a moderate tempo. So you can trust yourself somewhat on it. It was named organically. We can play it somewhat organically. If you're hearing it in a particular way, go with it. I don't think Sora would mind so much that. So I'm just going to play through briefly. I'm just going to sight read through this first little section here just to get it in your ear what this piece is, uh, is sounding like. This is just off the cuff. And then we'll look into it. And I'm sure that the things that we'll find as we explore it would change what it is I'm fixing to play right now. But as a basic once off here, let's see what comes out. So you basically get the gist of the, uh, of the piece from that. Um, we'll probably change some of those dynamics and, and some things like that, but more or less, that's what it sounds like. So let's just jump right in here and start looking at the basic form, because that's one of the first things we want to do, right? Is get a basic lay of the land, see what we're working with here. So we're in 3-8 time, so kind of a waltzy thing, as you probably heard as well. And then just glaring, glaring features this right here, this big repeat sign, that would lead me to believe that this first part is its own section. So let's just label that section A for that first section up to the repeat. And then what happens? We're trucking along, trucking along, trucking along. Well, here we have another repeat down here. So that's really glaring, right? Now this section is in much bigger than the first section. So I'm wondering if this is actually two sections kind of in one right here. And so what I'm going to look for is a long note. And here's one. It, there's a rest, but altogether right here, it's basically a big long note. So I'm wondering if this would be the end of a section and then a start over. So I just want to kind of explore that for a minute and look at what happens, especially since right up in here, right here we have this same type of thing. We have an eighth note and then an eighth note rest. And so I'm wondering then if this is, is this basically the same thing? Different notes, of course. And so I'll look at the notes after that and see if it resembles previous material, perhaps. And look at that. It does. So if we look right here, this is looking very similar to up here, right up in this area. So it looks like we're repeating the A section again. And I can go through and actually go measure by measure. Um, and see is this measure the same as this measure? Okay, looks like it. Is this measure the same as this measure? Um, right here? Yes, it is. Next one, next one. And so I've found, yes, it is. With, an, with the exception of that they look like they're doing some different stuff in the dynamics with, the, with our crescendos and decrescendos and dynamic markings. It looks like that's a little bit different, but the notes are the basically, they're basically the same here. So let's call this then the A section again. Let's just back up here, clean this up a little bit so that we can know what we're looking at. So we're going to call this the A section again. And that means that this right here is going to be the B section. So our basic form then is we do the A section twice with this repeat right here, yes? And then we have the B section and then we have this A section again and then we repeat that B section and then the A section again and that's our piece. A, A, B, A, B, A is our basic form of this piece which means that once we get A we've got a lot of the piece. We've got two-thirds of the piece when we get the A section, which is a lot of bang for the buck on learning, which is, which is pretty, pretty, pretty nice when that happens. Doesn't always, but sometimes it does. And it's pretty gratifying to learn such a large chunk at a time. It's great. So now that we know that, let's move along then. 
And so what we're going to do then is get into this first section. So how are we going to deal with this first section? We have to first look at there are notes going up, up stems, and down stems. So we have these up stems here, and we also have these down stems going on as well, right? So we have two different lines of music going on. Now, in the hand, especially the left hand, it doesn't seem like two lines of music. It just seems like one because we're just playing chord shapes and then putting on a finger here and there. But we have to remember that musically it is two lines of music. And so there's a few different ways that we could approach this right from the get-go. One would be, if you know any sort of theoretical analysis, would be to check out and see, okay, do I know the chord? And so it might be that you do, in which case it would make things a whole lot easier because then it would be easier to remember what chord shape you're working with. So this first one right here, this first one right here is just looking like a C chord. Yes, it's just a big C chord. So that's convenient. And then what happens? We have this stuff right here. And so we could go along and actually look at, we could just sight read it for one time through perhaps. And you may or may know, not know what that chord is. And if you don't, then it's not gonna matter if I tell you or not, it's a G7. But the main thing that you understand is that we have three notes going down. It's definitely a chord because we're actually skipping down here so we have, if you look at this, check this out. We have line, line, line. So this note, this note, and this note are all on line. So we're stacking up a chord here. And so whenever, we, whenever we've got chords, they stack on the staff. So it'll be line, 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 or space, 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 is, is high up as it goes. And so knowing that, then, Whenever you see jumps around like that, you know that you're dealing with some sort of chord. And so this is, this is some sort of arpeggio that we're working with here. So, in this case, we've got a G7 chord. And so we could just play it all at once. So let's just play this as a chord. So we start off with a C chord. And then we've got this second measure and you could play all the notes at once. Of course, you can't play all the notes at once because two of the notes are on the same string, right? And for that, I would just go back and forth with it. Start with the D, and then you have the B on the second string, but then just play it back and forth like that. We're just getting comfortable with what the left hand is basically doing. So we start with the C, and then we have that kind of thing going on in the second measure. Third measure, what do we have? A great big C chord. And so whenever you have this, then you can just put a big C right there. You could label that one as well if you wanted to, if it helped you to, to remember it as shapes. And then, um, am I playing the wrong string? Same thing as the second measure, you could just look at what are the notes on these strings, and since there's more than one on one of the strings, the D string, you just play it both ways, remembering the shape. This happens to be a G7 again, but it's not an obvious G7 because it's over B, and uh, meaning B is in the bass, and then we go back to another C chord right here. So it looks like we're going... C, G7, C, G7, C, G7, C, G7, back and forth, yes? And so this is the first four bars of the piece. And so we basically have C and then those two where we have the... Um, the different notes on that, on the two different strings in the second measure and then the C chord in the third measure, and then the G7 chord, we have those types of notes, 
note switching on the D, on the D string, and then back to our C. So now that we kind of have a basic idea of what the left hand is doing, we can actually just play it by itself, no right hand whatsoever, and just go through left hand all by itself. And let's just do that right now. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And so you can just do that, no right hand, because the right hand can confuse the issue. It's easier just to do it one hand at a time. It might not be easier, but it's definitely, it makes you focus on what that hand is actually doing. Now the flip to that is doing just the right hand by itself, and that's what I would do now. And I wouldn't necessarily do the left hand before the right hand as far as both of them together, or both of them separately. I might do the right hand before the left hand. It's very oftentimes better to do the right hand before the left hand, because you'll end up making fewer mistakes in the left hand if you've been visualizing it by playing the right hand. So let's just do, we'll just play it on open strings, and this is with the left hand on hiatus, and, uh, and then we'll just play this just the right hand by itself. Just going all the way over the bar, all the way over this bar so that whenever we, we're playing, then we actually have a stop right there. That way, if we go over the bar, then we've, we're building in continuity so we don't start stopping at the bar lines because the bar lines are inherently non-musical. Just like it's, hey, I'd like to, if, if we don't actually finish the thought, it doesn't, it doesn't come out right. Stopping at the bar, bar line is like stopping before something is actually finished. And so it just doesn't sit very well with the listener. So, practicing that hand separately to get, those, to get those shapes in there. Now that you've got the basic gist of how it goes with the both of the hands, then I would definitely take this and play the parts separately. And so, when we play the parts separately, then what we've got is a bass line. which is all of our stems down, right? So let's play that first. And really the, the idea of this piece, really our stop is here. We're going over the bar line for kicks to, to get the continuity, but really the phrase ends right here and then it starts just as we have a pickup note right here with the C and E. We do the exact same thing right here. So these are kind of the same idea and then we, we, we just go forward from there. So really the phrase ends here and then we, well it should say, it starts here and then goes forward from there. But no matter, we can play it a million different ways and so much the better. So whenever we're playing the parts separately, I think it's really good to remember what we want to do with our dynamics. And this is the time to do it. So you don't want to wait until you've got the whole piece. Let me just get all the notes and then I'll sprinkle some music on it, like on the top, like a finishing salt or some, some nice herbs or something. Herbs or herbs, if you're across the water. So instead, right whenever you're learning the piece, then put in your dynamics. And the rule of thumb that I recommend, which is not necessarily common, it's actually the opposite of what is common, but I think it works a whole lot better on the guitar, is whenever lines are going up, then get softer, get quieter. Whenever lines are going down, descending in pitch, get them louder. And it really speaks to the, to the strengths of the instrument. It also leads the music forward, which is the ultimate goal of, of any sort of dynamics, is to make it interesting and continuing the interest in the piece for the listener. You don't want to give them any chance to to relax their engagement. And you don't either. You don't want to relax your engagement with it either because that will be the cue to others that this is the time for you to tune out and, and think about something else. So instead, we're going to take this and if it goes, if the note resolves up, we basically have three one, three one, three one. 
is our thing. If the note goes up, we're going to get slightly quieter from one note to the next. If it goes down, we'll get slightly louder from one note to the next. So let's do this from, from the C at the beginning. So we're going to release that a little bit, which means we're going to get a little bit softer because we're going from C to D, up to D, so we'll get quieter. And then F to E gets louder because we're going down, F, E. And then C, B, we're going to get louder from the C to the B. And then back to C. And then it would do the exact same thing going forward. So you can just play with this. Now, from the one to the three, first beat to the third beat, you would just basically have the exact same shape. So, get quieter, now quieter yet. And back louder, now louder, louder, louder. And then back off. And so then that gives us a particular shape to the line. Doing the exact same thing in the upper line, in the top, then we have this line up here. So we have all of our up stems. We have our upper line. And so then whenever it's going up, so here we're going to get quieter from that note to that note, crescendo down here, back off to this and then get louder again. See how this is working? Back off to that, get louder across to there and back off up to that. I'm, I wrote that backwards. And then back off up to there. So this is going to be our basic dynamic sweep. So listen, we'll, we'll listen to that. So that way we've just determined the relative level of each note in comparison to the note next to it by the fact of is, it going, is the line going down or is it going up. If it's higher than the note before it, it'll be quieter than the note before it. If it's lower than the note before it, it'll be louder than the note before it. And this works most of the time. It works in the 90, 90th percentile of the time. This is really good musical choices to make. Not always is this the case, but it works a large, like a, a whopping massive amount of the time. This is, it makes music really beautiful if you play it with this particular dynamic habit. Now what this means is to not accent the high note because the high note is, you know, it's the highest note. So ultimately you could think about, well play it actually pretty close to the quietest of the notes around it. And so what we might do then is if we, and what somebody might do would be to look at this line right here and, um, and look at this note right here, which is the, which is the highest note of this whole phrase here is this F, right? Dun, da, 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 And then in the new phrase, we go up to the G, but to this point here, this F is the thing, is the loudest one. And so what you'll sometimes hear people do is this type of thing. And I just, I just don't think that it works very well. I think that there's much more beautiful ways to round that corner. So it just it, it meanders this way and brings you forward. There's no particular stopping place. It doesn't sound like there's no spot in there that sounds like, okay, we've arrived at the end and then we're starting over again. And that's what a loud high note does. And so just in general, I'll, you'll, hear me, uh, you'll hear me say this. If you watch these videos, you'll hear me say this a million times. But hopefully after, after 999,000 of them that it'll start to actually sink in. You'll start to hear this in your playing and, and, and decide to um, do the work that it takes to actually change the way. Because whenever we're naturally playing, the high notes want to pop out. If we're playing a, a scale passage, we want to pop out the high note. It just, for some reason on the guitar and the way the hands work, it wants to pop out. So you actually have to work at not doing it. So 
That's it. So with that, then that would be the dynamic sweep of our of our um, of our first section. Now I want to I want to talk for just two seconds here about this right here, which they start off with a mezzo piano and then they have these dynamic markings, right? So basically, we start off medium quiet and then we get quiet. We get quieter. And then we come back up to mezzo piano whenever we hit the new line. So basically what we're doing is fading now. We're starting off quietly and we're getting even quieter. And I just, I just have to disagree with that on a, on a structural level because it's, it's hard to make that interesting. If we start off quiet and we get even quieter, then this is, it, you know, then we're, it's a challenge to actually hold listeners' attention and make, it, make this compelling. If it's all, if it's just, if that's all it's going to be, so if we handle the connection of notes within that really well, such as what we've been talking about with all these red markings on here, then we can just we can just ignore this right here altogether, and just think of mezzo piano as the basic range of what we're doing. Now mezzo piano contains forte and it contains pianissimo. It's just the basic gist is mezzo mezzo piano. The basic, the basic mood is relatively, it's kind of medium quiet. It doesn't mean that every single note is quiet, and it doesn't mean that they're uniformly mezzo piano. There are soft notes, there are loud notes, and it's all, it's all within that. It's all the shades of gray within mezzo piano. And so I think that's really important to remember. And also to think of this as only a guide, just like the word moderato. It's medium tempo. Okay. Well, this is medium piano. Okay. That sort of thing. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be opposed. I mean, personally, I wouldn't be opposed to completely ignoring the dynamics, uh, the nitpicky dynamics, like the decrescendo sign right here. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to ignoring that and changing it if I didn't think it worked. Now I've, I've played a lot with the dynamics on pieces and know, now I kind of know what it is that I'm going for and the larger reason for that. And so I can readily say, I'm not going to do that. If you don't know that, then I would definitely play with the decrescendo like they're saying and then play it also like I'm recommending it and then see which one you, know, you think is, is more compelling to you. And, and so master them both ultimately master them both and then make an educated decision. If you haven't mastered them both, then you can't make a decision because you just don't know. You have no, you have no ground to stand on. So if you, um, if you disagree with me on any of this dynamic stuff, well, until you can play it to, to my satisfaction basically and play it exactly like this and, and, and connect organically and away from one to the next using this scheme, then you really just don't have a leg to stand on. Um, so master it first and then decide for yourself because maybe, maybe I'm absolutely full of it. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but you'll never know unless you master it and then decide for yourself. In my experience, it, it's really, it, it works really well and I learned it from a high level pianist who's played with every major orchestra in the world and it really uh, works for him and comes from a very long line of pianists and piano, uh, piano phrasing. So I think it works. So anyway, let's move on to the next, the next section. What do you say? So then from the next section, we're going to start right here. Let's get a more vibrant color here. We're going to start from right here because this is where the phrase starts on B3, just like it does at the beginning. So from here, we have basically the same thing. Yes, we have right hand, we have left hand, we have some of the same shapes some similar shapes in the hand as before. Now, this is an interesting thing. We're at a moderato and we're coming in the, this, this right here is a pull off. That means a pull off, right? And I don't know, just because it says there's a slur mark there doesn't mean that you have to do a pull off. A pull off has a particular, um, a particular sound and generally you have one of two things happening either either the second note the one that is pulled off to in this case the F 
either it's quieter, especially if you do a kind of a, a shoddy pull off and don't pull down and in to articulate it, but you just kind of lift your finger off, then it's definitely quieter than the first note, right? The F here would be quieter than the G. Um, also, whenever a lot of people do pull-offs, they accent the first one. So if I know there's a pull-off, I'm going to play it louder. That sort of thing. So that you end up getting this. Which I just don't really think is very uh, conducive to creating a long line and continuing on the action. It sounds like, it sounds like an arrival. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, well. Um, so instead, how about this? Also, we're dealing with another couple of issues, which are our dynamic issues. So ideally, using this rule of going up, we get softer. Then we're going to actually go and be quieter from there to there. And then we're going to crescendo down this line, right? Down this line of music in the top line here. And so if we do that, then we're at direct odds. We have conflicting desires here. To do the pull-off, it's probably going to be either quieter, I didn't finish this earlier, it's going to be quieter, or the tone's going to be bad. It's hard to make a pull-off note sound pretty. It just always has a particular kind of a tinny sound to it, uh, more times than not. It's, I guess it's possible, but it's hard to make them pretty. And in a moderato, you don't really need to do the pull-off. Now, if this thing was an allegro, maybe you'd need to do the pull-off. So if we want to crescendo this down, then we don't want the pull-off. We don't really need the pull-off because of the, the tempo isn't that demanding. Here's another thing, is that sometimes, if we want to give a particular lift or a sprightly quality, we can actually accent this note right here. Let me put that into a more vibrant color there. How about a nice blue? We could actually put an accent on that note. And so you end up something like this right here. It certainly kicks the music forward. It doesn't create a stopping point. So if you listen, ba da dum versus da da dum. If our goal is to continue and make a long line and, and constantly propel the music forward, I think that the pull off, accenting that high G and then pulling it off is going to not do that. I think it's going to basically get in the way of that and make it to where it's not as, as beautiful for, for the listener. So I would consider then actually not doing that, that pull off right there and instead playing it just, you know, whatever kind of fingering you want. You could go AMI on it, or you could go you could go MIM, what whatever you wanted to do on the on the fingering on that, you could do it. And actually crescendo this line. Dun dun dun, dun or dun dun dun, dun and bring out the F as the as the upbeat. It's an interesting note because it's the first sixteenth note we've had of the whole piece. So we've been going snapping along like this and all of a sudden ba 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 so it's it is different and so bringing attention to it as a new feature is is uh is fair game we we don't have to underplay it with that pull off so now that we've handled that i would just go through then and do hands separately again and then do the line the left hand or the, the bottom part. Play with that. Get the get the curves just like you want them, as its own thing, and then the top all by itself. Also, check this out. This is a this is a great uh, a great. Um, tip slash observation. If we are approaching a downbeat by a jump, 
as we are right here. Let's take a look at this on a clean sheet. If we're approaching this, this little spot right here, if we're approaching a downbeat by a jump or a strong beat by a leap, a jump, so E to G, minor third. If we actually play the lower note before the beat heavier, then the top note just comes out of it. It's like a, hopping on a, on a diving board in a pool. And then all of a sudden the top end seems very much more graceful. So whenever we have this jump right here, this from going up, a leap up to a strong beat, play the lower note louder, play the, the higher note softer, and it, will just, it just comes right out of that lower note. So that's another tip. I'll send you an extra bill for that one. So as we play then the top line, let's just take a listen to it really quick. Sorry. Now here's something really interesting in this line, and that's the half the half steps. We approach a lot of these harmony changes by a half step, and half steps are interesting. So half steps, I would just go through here and mark the half steps. Here's a B to a C, that's a half step. Here we have, in the bass we have an E to an F, that's a half step. Here we have a B to a C, that's a half step. So really we're outlining each of these harmony changes by half step. And that would be an interesting thing to just play with. So just play one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. And that's just playing the half steps. Now, whenever we have a half step, especially to a strong beat like that, it's oftentimes very interesting in the ear to bring out the lower of the half step. So the leading tone before the beat, just like we just did with the leap, da, da. We can also go da da, and then in the bass da da, and then da da. Strong on the um, strong on the last note of the preceding harmony, and then lessen on the downbeat of the new harmony. So it ends up sounding like this. If we bring that out and play both line, or if we play just the top line and and do this, it would end up sounding like this. From just to clarify, from here, we would have da 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 I just played the bass line on that other one instead of the melody, which is kind of a little bit screwy if, if you're not actually playing along with this. So let me do it again with just the top line. So in that, interestingly then, you get the effect, by the end, you get the effect of this decrescendo that they're suggesting. But it's not so, um, but it's by note. It's, it's, a, it's a relationship of note to note instead of just an overall getting, getting quieter. So isn't that, isn't that interesting? Putting both of the parts together on that then we have loud, soft, more, more. Loud, soft, and loud, soft, and loud, soft. Of course, it's not just black and white, loud and soft. I mean, there are subtle movements within there. But if we know what's leading to what, this half step is leading to this, and we go dissonant, consonant, old, new, would be another way to think of it. Or I use this a lot, and here, or to here. To do that would be and here, and here, and to here, and to here. Something like that. So that you're saying, and to here for the two, three, one, the beats, the second beat, third beat, first beat. So that you're leading forward to the downbeat instead of going 
one, two, three, one, two, three, which is kind of heavy footed. Instead we go two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, which is leading over the bar. And so if you can practice your pieces like this, it makes it much more gorgeous to listen to because it actually leads forward like, like, it's, like it's meant to. So that is the second section. So then we can jump into the next section, which is the B section. So we've now come to a point. We've gotten, oops, there we go, a B. Now we've gotten through this whole first section and we've got, it's two things, but we want to create one thing of it. Just to talk for one more second on the A. So with the A section, we want to think of it, we don't want to come down too hard or start over too much. And what, what accenting this note will do, will make, make it start over and create two, seconds in, two sections. Instead, don't accent that note and create one section out of the entire, the entire A section. So, onward to the B section. It looks very similar, doesn't it? We're looking at this, it looks like it's the same type of material as before, right? Meaning the bass line has the same rhythm, the top line has the basically the same type of thing. It's also jumping around chord tones. Ooh, excuse me. And, um, and it starts on a C, no less. So let's check it out hands separately let's just do the right hand first so we just play just the right hand Boom. oh actually before we even do that this first one was set up into four four bar sections right one two three four and then we started again one two three four let's see if the B section does that as well so we have one two three four and then one two three four well, maybe, but it's not completely obvious by looking at it because we don't go back to the C, right? So we'll have to listen to it and, uh, and see if that's what's happening. So we'll just continue on from the beginning. It's good to look at for this thing and if, just in case it's obvious. So from here, right hand by itself, It sounds like with that open strings, it sounds like it's a pattern, right? So if that's too much to do those four bars, I just played it to right here. If that's too much at one time, then just play the first bar. Just play that. Or I should say, don't play that actually. Just play that and then that. Two, three, one or three, one, two or anything like that. Or three, one, two, three, one. Bigger sections like that even. So however you want to practice it, but make small sections. Make small sections and then practice the small sections in hand separately and then put it together. If you play the whole piece hand separately, it's like you've, but you've forgotten what you've done in the first part by the time you get to the end part. So keep your sections really small. Measure two, four measures if you can swing it, but uh, just just a little bit. And then do the left hand by itself. So we have doom, doom, doom. So now our chords are changing much more often. It's not just one chord shape per measure, but now it's two. So that's an interesting thing to, to observe, is that here's one chord. We have C. Let's go into a, uh, so this is a C going to a G chord over B, A minor, G again, C, G, A minor, G, and A minor, Ooh, A minor, A minor. And then it continues on from there. We could just go ahead and do it. G, then it looks like we're walking up to perhaps a B. Definitely just a little accidental there. It's this note of note of note. 
back to C for the full chord. And then we have, looks like a D7, D7, G. So cadencing into G, and then that's our section. So anyway, for what it's worth that. So then when we're, we're looking at this, we're gonna do just the left hand by itself. Boom, 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 boom. So if, you, if you're practicing this, then just take maybe five notes at a time. Three, one, two, three, one. Three, one, two, three, one. And just take that, would be this section right here. Here's a section. And then you could start off with, if you'd like to, overlap that with this section, which could then overlap with this section. So you're constantly creating overlapping sections of, of five notes for this. That's just one way. There are a million ways, at least a million. But you could do something like that to where you're overlapping your, um, your, your practice sections. And then by the time you did that, you just go through and just do that a few times each, then you're going to know this piece way better by doing that. Remember that when you're practicing these pieces, you want to practice, you want to work on your skills of practice. That's really what we're doing. The piece gets played in the process, but really what we're doing is we're practicing practicing. We're saying, okay, how can I practice in a new way, in a different way, that actually leads to me understanding the piece better and leads to me understanding the music better and growing as a musician and developing as a musician so that every, with every piece I'm getting stronger and stronger in both my knowledge and my understanding and my emotional depth into what works in music and in my technical aspects, my ability to visualize music, all of these things. It, you want to improve with every single piece you play and the way to do that is to practice in a bunch of different ways and to put challenges to yourself like this. Work this small section, do it hand separately. A lot of people cringe at hand separately, especially the right hand by itself. A lot of people really shy away from it. I was like, well, if it's hard, maybe it's good for you. Hello. So right hand by itself, totally good. Any of this is good. And really the point is that you get used to looking at a piece from a bunch of different ways instead of just playing the piece, like just sight reading it into submission. If I play it a million times, I'll get it. Nah, but you'll still not play it well. You know, the question is, how well do you play it? Not can you play it? Who cares if you can play the notes? I can plug this thing into my computer and it can play the notes at a million miles an hour. Playing the notes is just is a foregone conclusion. How we play, that's really where, that's the human aspect of it. That's what we get to do as artists is develop that. And that's what we're talking about here. So when we get, let's go forward. Now that we've got some, um, our basic fingerings, simultaneously while we're doing that, we can look at are the notes going down or up or, and so we can do our dynamics in this way. So from here to here, we're going to crescendo this line and then we back off to there and then we crescendo down, back off to here, crescendo down. Do you see the pattern happening? Back off to here, crescendo down, back off to here, crescendo. I'm just gonna take the whole thing down, back off to there, back off all the way to there, crescendo down to that, so that we can decrescendo. Oop, that was an ugly one. So that we can back off to there, crescendo down, decrescendo, decrescendo. So a whole bunch of little things going on in there, yes? a bunch of different things to do. So as you go through, you can practice getting each of these and go slow. And yes, it's tough because you're actually saying each note has a particular value that we want to put into it and a particular level that it needs to play. And so it takes a massive amount of control and focus, but that's what we're doing here, right? We're, we're building these things and that's what's so fun. What it does is it might also, um, point out things that you're not as good at whenever, like one of these things that we've talked about may be more comfortable, some of them that we talked about here may be less comfortable. And so if that's the case, then 
you may want to just take note of that and say, okay, well, what is it? What weakness of mine is making it to where I'm uncomfortable with this? Something like that. Or there might be a particular attitude of, I don't have time to deal with that. I just want to play the piece. And then that is well worth examining as well. That just that general attitude and saying, well, why are you playing the piece then? Is it just to do it and just to have the trophy at the end or is it actually, you know, enjoy it and have a great uh, musical lifetime as constantly growing musician? So just things worthy of note. That gets us through to this one right here. So let's take a look now. We've got a couple of accidentals in here. This chord right here is dissonant. It's out of the key. So from that measure 13, we have... I would accent that for sure. It's interesting. And it's a half step. It allows us to approach, if you remember from before our half steps, it allows us to approach that E by half step, which is, which is interesting. We want to bring that out. So from the measure 13 again. This is, yeah, so bring out, bring out that right there. The same right here, this is basically the same line as up here with, a, with an extra note stuck in, right? Here we have this, here we don't have that. But otherwise, it's a very similar section. It's not exactly the same, is it? No, it's not. We release differently. This one goes to the D, this one goes to the E. So be it. So when we're playing this one, so definitely bring out that. When we're playing this one, I would do the exact same thing again as this. I would treat it the exact same way as we did this right here, meaning a little bit more here, a little bit less here. So decrescendo to there. And then crescendo this down and even maybe bring out this note right there. Make this note, uh, bring that note out this F sharp right there. Bring it out so that we have, I'm just going to back up to the measure before it. Sorry. Dun da dum or dun da dum. Either one of those will work. But we definitely want to play the F sharp louder than, we want to play this F sharp right here, it needs to be louder than this G right here. So we definitely want to crescendo from that note to that note and all the way down to the, to the E as well. And then back off from there to there. So just different ways of handling that. Then how do we connect from here, right? Because now we have, we have this rest, and so then how do we come back? We have basically, we're shown a mezzo piano right here. And so I think I would go with it. Now the difference in this is that in the middle of this, they actually come up to a forte down here at the bottom. See that? They don't in the first time around. The notes are all the same, but all of a sudden we're handling, oh, they're not the same. Look at that. This is why we check, isn't it? So it starts off the same. Let's play this last section here. This A section again, which is really turning into an A prime, A with a little one next to it. Yes, it's a little tag ending. It's a little it's a little ending right so it's slightly different so this section right here is different than the a section so the way that we would write that in our thing would be a prime it's kind of like the a section but it's not exactly like the a section it's based on the a section it's um it's basically the a section but it's different and so we would just say a prime and so we just put a little one next to it and that's how we, in our form, would then be A, A, 
a, I'm sorry, a, a, b, a prime, b, a prime. So really that's the form that we were talking about from the beginning. So let's take a look at this ending and just see what, see what's going on with it. So it's from here, they're recommending a big forte. We've been decorationing, so we take the mezzo piano, actually get quieter again is what they're recommending, which I would treat it exactly like we treated this up here, which is to not do that and to actually shape that as we were talking about earlier. I would do that again and then do just like we did right here, right? Big on this C, back off a bit to here. So I would definitely decrescendo here so that you can still crescendo. Now the difference is, just like we were talking about the shades, of mezzo piano has all of these things in it. It has forte in it, it has pianissimo in it. So does forte. Forte has piano in it. It has fortissimo in it. It has it all in it. The basic vibe is big. It's just big and loud. That's what the basic vibe of this is. And so you want to take it with that type of attitude. It's basically the strong triumphant finish, right? What is it? Something like that. Another way to do it, since we're doing it twice, we could actually round the corner differently if we wanted to. I definitely would say da da right here. Well, like we talked about, approaching the downbeat high note from a low note with accenting this note so that we have, I make my accents inconsistent, I'm realizing here. Accent this note, big, how about a big plus sign? That'll work. Da da, and then back off to that. Da da, da crescendo down, back off, then crescendo, back off, back off. Now, also, like we talked about earlier, we just want to point out the half steps too, right? Here's the B leading to the C. Pretty nice at the very end. Classic. So I, I like the decrescendo to the end like this, like they're suggesting. Whether it actually decrescendos this entire time, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't accept offhand. Overall, I do think a taper is nice. Da dum, da dum. But there may be like a crescendo right in here, from there to there. Definitely from there to there, there's one. So that then we back off from there to there. Something like that. So that we're placing each note exactly like we want to place it. And so is there a little, is there this the perfect spot to play each little note? Is there a particular perfect spot for that one little note? Probably, but it's really it has to do with the context of the notes around it. And so we want to remember our basic idea of is this moving the music forward or is it actually creating a spot that jumps out and stops the action? If you're playing a high note loudly, it stops the action. I'm just going to tell you that one right now. Um, if you're playing an offbeat or a, a dissonant note right before the beat loudly, it just may propel the music forward as a little kicker. So it, it, you can play with these different ideas on it. And this is constantly a negotiation in the moment of technique versus concepts. One of the things that you can do that would really help this would be to sing it. Put your guitar down audios, guitar, and just conduct this and sing it. Something like that, to where you actually are singing it, you're deciding how you're going to do it. If you can actually sing it, then you actually know it. If you're just playing it with your fingers, you can kind of fill in some blanks with muscle memory and you might not actually know it all that well. 
If you actually put your guitar down and sing it, then you will, actually, you will have to know what you're doing and you have to make decisions with your mouth and do it with your body, with your breath. And that's, that's a whole different ball game than just wiggling your fingers. And it may not be comfortable at first, but hey, what else are you doing, right? So that's the moderato. We take our repeats and, uh, and, and just go right forward with it. So bottom line, I hope you got something out of this. If you're watching other ones, you'll hear me repeat a lot of this material, but it's because I believe in it from the bottom of my heart that it works. And so I wish for you to play beautifully, practice well, patiently, constantly looking at things in different ways and spinning it around and practicing playing with the piece instead of just playing the piece and make it into a fun, a fun part of your practice and a great part of your day. Thanks for watching. Take care.